So we're going to start at the top and yep. the sheer is titled um, ER, the month of second chances. And I want to speak about ER and just figure out what it's really about. And to do that, we should look at where ER is even talked about, which one place is in Machim Aleph. Um, would people feel comfortable like reading? Yes, no. I see Rachel nodding her head. Rachel, um, do you want to read the first source? I could read. Sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. By he, Vishmanim Shana, the Arba Meo Shana, let's say Pene Srama Eretz Mitzrayim, Bashana Harvi, Bachodesh Ziv, Hu, Bachodesh Hashimi, Lemoch Shlomo, Al Yisrael, Vayvain Habay, Lashem. Okay, so in the 480th year after the Israelites left the land of Egypt in the month of Ziv, that is the second month in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. So we have this word Ziv that Sepharia doesn't even translate. It's like, I'm not going near that. And then Rashi says, Bechodesh Ziv, hu iar de it be Ziva li lana, became Tirgim Yonatan, Ziv Nitzanya. So Rashi says in the month of Ziv, this is ER because the trees have blossoms and Yonatan translated this similarly, the bloom of the bud. So some people translate Ziv as the actual blooming and some people say that it's talking about ER, which is when blooms happen, but like people don't really like to go near the word Ziv. It's just not translated in general. Um, and then Rashi says again, Hu chodash hasheni l'minyan ha it's the second month according to the counting of the months. Shahare Nisan Rosh Hashanah because Nisan is the first month of counting. Um, the next source is we don't have to like do it inside, but it's just the Sefer Achinach talking about Pesach Sheni. And we have, he says, should we do it inside? I don't know, I'm bad at timing right now. Um, thanks, Gila. Um, does someone want to read? Jacob. Jacob left. He's probably playing basketball. Yeah, he opted for camera off. Does someone else want to read? Oh, Ron sorry. sorry. I would read, but it's all blank. I can't. I can't open the source thing. <laughs> so, if anyone else wants to, <laughs> or you could just. Yeah, I'm happy to read. Maybe I'll read it in English. Go for it. Please. Okay, the commandment of the second Pesach on the, is, is on the 14th of ER, that anyone who is unable to offer the first Pesach offering on the 14th day of Nisan, for example, due to impurity because he's at a distance, he should offer the second Pesach offering on the 14th day of ER, as it is stated, on the second month of the 14th day in the afternoon, you shall offer it. The sages taught us further that it is not specifically ritual impurity or distance, but any case of inadvertence or duress, or even if it was volitional and he did not offer the first one, he may offer the second one. And since this is a great fundamental principle of our religion, the obligation even extends to a convert who converted between the first Pesach and the second, and so to a child who's maturity between the two Pesachim, that they are all obligated to offer the Pesach Shemi sacrifice. Interesting. So this is a much abbreviated version of the Sefer Chinuch because it's really long as the Sefer Chinuch does. Um, but what he talks about is that Pesach is so fundamental to our people and to our religion because it's really when we, we became a nation and it's when God showed his might and showed what he was capable of with Kriyat Hayam Sif and taking us out of Egypt. So Pesach is so important that if someone misses it, even if they did it not because they physically couldn't, but because he just decided not to or he wasn't able to for some reason other than ritual impurity which we know it would be okay but something else that like he either like mentally or physically wasn't capable of bringing the Pesach then he should still bring a Pesach Shani meaning that it doesn't have to be an extreme case where you're incapable of bringing the Karban Pesach and celebrating and commemorating the Exodus no matter what it is, you can then bring the Pesach Sheni to make up for it. And then he goes on to say that so much so that if someone converts between Nisan and Iyar, 
and then he brings the Pesach Sheni, meaning if he wasn't even Jewish, so he wasn't obligated at all, then he would still have to bring the Pesach Sheni. And also, a kid who only becomes Bar Mitzvah after Pesach, he would also bring the Pesach Sheni because it's so important that we have the Karban Pesach and we commemorate the Exodus that it doesn't matter why you missed the first one. The second one is just as, or if not more important than the first time and everyone can bring it. Do we have someone for the next source? I can do it. I can read it if you need. <laughs> go for it. No, go. Yeah, and then Danielle, you could do the next one. He said, if you heed the Lord your God diligently, doing what is upright in his sight, giving ear to his commandments and keeping his laws, and I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Okay, so, so far what we've seen is just how ER is spoken about in the Pasuk, right? It's the second month. It's Chodesh Ziv, and it's also the time of the Pesach Shini. It's this time to, a second chance to bring the Karban Pesach, and everyone can bring in it, and it doesn't really matter what happened in the last month, but it's this a month for a second chance for a Pesach. That seems to be what we know about it. And then what happens is that a Kabbalistic reading of this Pesach develops where they then say that ER is hinted to in this Pesach at the end where it says, Ani Hashem Ropecha, the Aleph Yud Resh of ER is there and it's for I Hashem am your healer. And now we're looking at ER as this time of healing. And this time where it represents Hashem's healing specifically, not just any healing, but Hashem's healing. So just to like put that in perspective, we have these ideas of ER constantly being second, constantly being like, a, maybe you could think of it as a fix for the Pesach that you may, missed or something better, something different. Something Somehow you're like required in Pesach Sheni, even if you missed the first one and you weren't even like Jewish or you weren't even considered an adult. And now we have this other idea that ER is about healing. Danielle, do you want to read the next one? It's kind of long, so you could read it in English. Okay, sounds good. All right. Um, Rabbi Akiva says that the verse should be understood as follows. If one study Torah, in his youth, he should study more Torah in his old age. If he has students in his youth, he should have additional students in his old age, as it is stated, in the morning you switch, sow your seeds, etc. They said, by the way of example, that Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pa pairs of students in the area of the land that stretched from Giva to Antipatris in Judea, and they all died in one period of time because they did not treat each other with respect. When the world was desolate of Torah until Rabbi Akiva came to our rabbis and in the south and taught them to his Torah, taught his Torah to them. The second group of disciples consisted of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shimua. And these are the very ones who upheld the study of Torah at that time. Although Rabbi Akiva's earlier students did not survive, his later disciples were able to transmit the Torah to future generations. With, the, with regard to the 12,000 pairs of Rabbi Akiva students, the Gemara adds, yeah. it is taught that all of them died in the period of time from Passover until Shavuot. Okay, so it's a, like I said, a long text, so we'll break it down into smaller pieces. So first we have Rabbi Akiva just interpreting a Pasuk, right? It says to, in the morning, sow your seed, and everyone's trying to figure out what that means. And he says that if you have students in your youth, then that doesn't mean that you just stop teaching, like, okay, you're done, like, I don't know, you turn 30, and whatever you have, you have, you turn 50, whatever you have, you have. It means that you keep teaching, you keep teaching when you're older, and the assumption is, is that you don't, if you didn't do stuff in your youth, for sure you do stuff now, but he's saying, it's, he's responding to the assumption that if you do things when you're young, if you do things before, then you're done, like, you don't have to do anything else. 
And he's responding that, no, you're, you're not done and you continue to work. And he doesn't just say that as a reading in a pasuk. He actually lives by it because what happens, he has 12,000 pairs of students, 24,000 students, and they all died between Pesach and Shavuot, which is why we have Minhagim to have different like mourning practices at this time of year. And we constantly think about it and it could have just been tragedy. And he could have just said, I'm a teacher and I thought I was a great teacher. Like look at all my students, but I don't have any students now. And I like did everything that Hashem told me to do. I taught people, I like really lived up to my potential. And then he lost everything. But instead of saying, okay, I'm done. He thought about what he'd learned from this Pasuk or maybe he thought about it retroactively. Maybe he lived and then said, where did I learn this? And where can I teach this to other people from? And he looked at this Pasuk and said, you teach people even your, in your old age, you teach people even despite what happened in the past or because of what happened in the past, you don't stop. And that's when he had a second group, which was Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar Ben Shemua, who were all great scholars. And it seems like a much smaller group, right? It's only a handful of people versus 24,000 people. It's a crazy difference. But we're told that these are the ones that kept the Torah going. And thank you to Steinzels and <laughs> his English translation on Zafaria. We see that although Rabbi Akiva's earlier students did not survive, his later disciples were still able to transmit the Torah to future generations. And it was not just about quantity. It wasn't just um, since he lost 24,000 students, he was incapable of making any difference. Since he continued and since he taught even in his old age and he taught even after loss, that's why the Torah was able to continue for future generations. And this happens at the same time of Sfirat HaOmer, as we know, between Pesach and Shavuot. So now we're going to learn some sources about Omer and Sfirat HaOmer. Do I have any volunteers to read? Gila. I just unmute myself. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. The Spartan and Lachem, the Harada Shabbat, Miyoma Viacham, and Omer Hatsnuva, Sheva Shabbat, that's Mimotiana. And from the day on which you bring the sheaf of elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath, you shall count off seven weeks. They must be complete. Awesome. So there we go. From the day on which you bring the sheaf of elevation offering, then you shall count off seven weeks. Cool. <laughs> that's the mitzvah. Do I have a volunteer for the next one? I can read it. Okay, this is from Sever Chinuch again. Vamru zechonam uvracha imatai hein t'mimo b'zman shemetchil ba'erev. So there are those that say if someone forgot to count and sorry, sorry, I added a line. Um, Umikol makom parshu hamafarshim she'im shachach velo mana mivarev monel lemachar kol yom. So if someone forgot at night to count, because we're supposed to count at night, then during the day he has the whole day to count and make up for it. It's fine. Vishom remsham shemisha shachach velo mana yom echad she'in yacholim not od beotashana lefi shakulan mitzvah rachat heim. And then there are those that say, if you miss it at night, you can't make it up in the next day. And not only can you not make it up in the next day, but like your whole chance of counting Sfirat HaOmer is done. It's one mitzvah. It's not like a daily mitzvah that starts and ends every single day. It's just one big thing and you throw the whole thing out. It's all thrown out. And our teachers in this generation just don't vibe with this. And I think here is the same debate that Rabbi Akiva is talking about and the same question that we have in ER when we have Pesach Sheni. It's, if you missed it, are you done now? Do you not have another chance? And here what the Sefer Chinuch is saying is, yeah, there are those people that want to say, if you miss a single night of counting Sfira, then you don't even have the next day to make it up. You're just done. The whole thing is one mitzvah and you've lost all of it. 
but he says, no, we throw that out. We reject that. Like, that's not how we live. That's not how we're supposed to live. If you miss it at night, you have the whole next day to make it up. And this goes back to um, the original Pasuk when it says, um, Shava Shava Shalot Tmimot, seven whole weeks. Whole doesn't mean that everything's perfect and you can't make any mistakes and you'll never fix it. Whole doesn't mean that whatever you like have done, that's it. Whole means that you have another chance. And that's the lesson that we have in Pesach Sheni with Rabbi Akiva and here. Um, and do we have a volunteer for the next source? Here we again. Go for it. Teach us to count our days rightly that we may obtain a wise heart. Um, I think there was one before that. Oh, sorry. All good. I scrolled down too much. <laughs> okay. Um, ben hashmashot um, so if someone asks you during twilight or later, what is tonight's count, you should tell him, yesterday was such and such. Or if you would tell him today's count, you're not permitted to say the bracha when you count the Omer later that night. Or if, for example, you say you just said the number 12 without saying today's 12th day, you can still count the Omer with a bracha. So this is like an added halacha that some of us might have encountered before where like this whole weird phenomenon where in general if you ask people like what time it is what's the date any of that they just tell you and then between Pesach and Shavuot it's like what's the day and it's like hmm, yesterday was this and then you do like everyone's doing math equations in their head and it's really strange and then not only is it strange and like oh you're supposed to do that but if you say tonight's date or today's date then you can't even say the bracha. It's as if you counted without a bracha and like you're done. It's You did the mitzvah, you missed the bracha, but you did the mitzvah, you counted without even meaning to. And then the next verse, which Rachel so read, which um, is good because we're excited. Also, Jacob thought that I was speaking at like seven. Everyone's just excited. We're moving very fast. <laughs> um, so in Tehillim, we have Teach us to count our days rightly, that we may obtain a wise heart. And then we have in Kohelet, in a similar vein, Whoever keeps commandments won't know any evil thing. And a wise man knows times and he knows judgments. So there seems to be this connection between time and counting and days and a wise heart. And this is what these psikim and all the ideas that we've seen so far, I think really show us what ER is about and hopefully will help us answer what Ziv is about. So when you have time, and the date, and you're paying attention to every single day, that's supposedly going to get you a wise heart. And counting at every moment becomes a mitzvah between Pesach and Shavuot, which is kind of crazy that like you get mitzvot and you get rewards for just keeping track of the calendar, which is much harder with Corona, but in general, it's like not so hard and our phones really do the work for us. And I get like four texts of Sphira every night. So like, how much work are we really doing? We're just counting. It's not so intense. And also like timekeeping, same thing. Like you wear a watch, big deal. Mazal tov, you get a mitzvah. Um, but I think it is true because I think that the most, one of the most valuable things we have, maybe the most valuable thing we have is time. And when we make every second count and we actually are present, that's when will be wise hearted. That's when we'll like think well, we'll be able to be more empathetic and more present. And that's the word that I want you to walk out of this year. This Chabura thinking is just presence where in ER, 
it's the month of not being aware of what just happened and being aware of what the past was, but also being fully present. This is the only month that's completely in sphere. We care about what day it is, both like the Hebrew date and also the sphere date every single day. It's an extra counting. It's completely encompassed in this idea of being present and being in every moment. And that's the same thing with Pesach Sheni. It doesn't matter what happened last Pesach. It doesn't matter where you were. It doesn't matter if you were Jewish. It doesn't matter what happened last Pesach that you didn't bring a carbon. Now you can bring a carbon, so you do that. With Rabbi Akiva, it doesn't matter. And that's not to say that it's not a tragic loss that his students all passed away. Of course, that's so tragic, and it deserves to be mourned and cried about. But it doesn't mean you stop. It means that you are present now. And what can you do now? He acquired five more students and literally continued the transmission of Torah despite tragedy because he saw that now matters just as much as yesterday and just as much as tomorrow. It's also about not constantly planning. The same thing applies when you go to Shavuot. If Shavuot was in ER, then you couldn't have the idea that, of being fully present because then you'd be in the future. So ER is about being completely encompassed and counting and being fully here and fully right now and just bringing your whole self to the moment. Now, when we go back to Ziv, when we think about what is Ziv, Ziv is the blossoming. And it's really interesting because when you look at a tree, if you're, let's say like a woodcutter, then the blossoms don't really matter to you. You just care about the wood. And if you're just a person who wants food, then <laughs> you don't really care about the blossoms. You just want the fruit. Like this month, the month of blossoms is kind of pointless. It's just kind of like, where's the fruit? Or like before that, it's winter. Like there's nothing really happening. It's just this kind of blossom or something's in this in-between state. And also a lot of people say that the um, counting of Sfirat HaOmer is really about like yearning towards the Torah, learn yearning towards receiving this intense connection with Hashem. And it, it's weird that we care so much about counting every day till then. Like if we're yearning for something that we don't really care about right now. But the message of Sfirat HaOmer and ER, I think, is that we do care about right now and we care about each day and the yearning matters, the journey matters and the blossoms are maybe not for utilitarian purposes, the like best thing in the world, but it's definitely the most beautiful time to look at a tree when there's blossoms and there's just flowers everywhere. And I give you all a bracha that you can be present, not only to enjoy the blossoms when you're walking outside, but also to be present in your conversations and in your tefillot and just in your day-to-day -day lives throughout this year.